Okay, so welcome to today's lecture. And uh, today we shall uh, go finally to maybe the most famous problem in information theory, which is noisy channel coding. Yeah. Last lecture, we did some important lemmas. We saw the one shot covering and the one shot packing lemmas, both in expectation and in concentration. Okay, so let's recall. So the covering lemma for L1 in expectation uh, looks like this. So there's this joint probability distribution on X1. I draw Y1, Y2 dot dot, Yn, Iid from the marginal Py, okay? Now for every Yi, let's say for little Y1, I look at the condition on X given uh, little Y1. Similarly, I look at the condition on X given little Y2 and so on. I take the sample average of this conditional probability distribution. So these are probability distribution on X. I take the sample average and it should be close to the marginal distribution on X in L1, okay? So the covering lemma says that the L1 distance between the sample average and the uh, marginal or uh, the true average specifically is less than five F7 provided the number of samples uh, Y1 to Yn is uh, larger than this one. So the important thing to note here is it's exponential in two to the smooth i max. Okay. And there is also this multiplicative fudge of one of okay. So this statement, okay, I call it L1 because the distance between the sample average and the true average is measured in L1 distance. And in expectation because the L1 distance is less than five at seven, in expectation over the choice of the samples, little y1 to little y. Now, this covering lemma is equal to the convex split lemma, okay? And in fact, we uh, prove the convex split lemma and that implied a proof of the covering lemma. So this is a very beautiful lemma. Like every day uh, I uh, like realize that there are like novel uh, uses and applications of it. So this convex split lemma states the following. So it's like a sophisticated rejection sampling. So suppose I take uh, n plus one independent distributions. So this distribution is at the marginal x, uh, then independently there are uh, like capital N copies of the marginal on y. All of them are independent. So this is closed in L1. Okay, it's five seven closing the L1 distance to the distribution of the right hand side. So what is the distribution on the right hand side? Choose an index i from one to n at random, uniformly at random. Correlate x with y. So now x and y satisfy the joint distribution. And leave the remaining y minus i's. Okay, the, the remaining y's untouched. Okay. So it turns out that uh, the left hand side and the right hand side distribution are closed, which is it's an amazing thing. Left hand side is completely independent. The right hand side has uh, correlation. It looks mild, but then I mean, I'm averaging it over the uh, uh, i equal to one, two, three, and so on. So, so priori, it's not clear why uh, it should be closed at all, but the convex split lemma guarantees it is, uh, provided n is larger than this one. And we saw why the two lemmas are equal in covering for L1 in expectation is equal to convex split lemma. Then we saw the packing lemma in expectation. Okay. So again, we take y1 to y1, y2 dot dot yl, independent uh, samples from the marginal py. Okay. Now for each sample yi, we look at what is the conditional distribution x given yl. Okay. Now, the packing lemma requires a decoder. So once I fix the particular sample y1 to yn, uh, the packing lemma says that there is a decoder, which is fixed, it's a function of the sample. So y subscript uh, n in boxes means uh, the decoder d depends upon the particular sample y1 to y. Now this decoder does an amazing thing. If it is fed an input from the condition on x given yi with high probability it will output y. So it can actually identify uh, the sample yi okay, from its uh, effect on x. So the probability that decoder fails to identify y, uh, that's the benefit. Just a second. So uh, what, uh, what is the channel output? The channel output is x or y? Is it, it's, is it x? 
if you want to think of it as a channel it is x okay okay so yeah it's kind of unfortunate uh, i think i was trying to match the complex bit yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's kind of unfortunate but yeah if you want to think of it as a channel it is x so the decoder given uh, a sample from the conditional distribution on x okay for a particular uh, y1 let's say will uh, output y1 so it will identify the sample on i or uh, y with high probability see the decoder already knows that the sample is from one of these y1 to y n as i said the uh, the construction decoder is sensitive to the sample so it knows the set from which the sample can come and like identify the sample from its uh, uh, after effect so okay, from its effect on x so the probability that it fails is uh, less than epsilon plus delta t after you do this uh, uh, averaging over samples and then there's an expectation over sample also okay so this is the packing lemma in expectation because it's expectation of samples so this is less than epsilon plus delta if n is less than this quantity so i think in the lecture i had made this two epsilon i had put delta equal to epsilon but it sort of helps to separate uh, the two parts of the proof out so so let us say uh, the error in the packing lemma is less than epsilon plus delta if n is less than this quantity so the epsilon affects the smoothing parameter in the i mean the hypothesis testing neutral information and delta is the fudge that i put <laughs> so so there are applications where we need this fine grade control of the error okay and uh, so this was covering and packing lemmas in expectation right expectation over the wise so there are concentration versions of the packing and coming lemma so it says that the probability that the function deviates above expectation by more than delta decays it decays exponentially the number of samples n and delta c so what do i mean so for covering lemma this is the function this l1 distance right so this is the function of the sample okay so the expected value of this function is less than 5 epsilon so the concentration version says that the probability that this function okay, this l1 distance uh, exceeds 5 epsilon by delta so probability that this l1 distance is greater than 5 epsilon plus delta will decay exponentially in the number of samples n and delta c and similarly for packing lemma it will uh, say that so there is a doubly exponential dependence on the i max i i, I, I max uh, epsilon x y then the decay rate i mean yes e to the minus 2 to the so it's like yes. very very fast it's very very fast yeah. okay okay yeah and uh, yeah for, so for uh, the packing lemma the concentration version would tell me that uh, yeah this is the function the function is the decoding er error over the sample okay so its expectation is less than epsilon plus uh, delta let's say so the probability that the decoding error exceeds epsilon plus delta plus delta prime will decay exponentially in the number of samples n and delta prime squared okay. so this is these are the two concentration versions so they will follow easily from the expectation version by using the method of boundary difference okay these functions have what are called boundary differences and we are looking at the probability over the, uh, a product probability distribution right iid samples y1 to y so that method the boundary difference is kicks in okay and maybe i'll just remind you of the two pictures of uh, so this is the covering picture right so there's this, there are the samples y1 to yn and there are the conditionals on x so the effect that y1 has on x so there's the conditional on x when i have little y1 condition on x when one has little y2 and so on so the covering lemma wants you to cover almost every uh, sample point x in other words i want this average to be close to px for the margin okay and it turns out that uh, yeah so n uh, approximately equal to 2 to the i epsilon max so the i epsilon max controls the covering there's a fudge of 1 by epsilon square also multiplied and so it's actually larger than 2 to the i epsilon max okay so the epsilon square in the denominator then for the packing lemma uh, the picture is slightly different so there are these iid samples y1 to yn the effect of y1 is given by the condition okay i want these conditionals for different y's to be mostly disjoint i've drawn them disjoint out here so i want them to be almost disjoint 
So they are all distinguished. So if they're distinguishable, uh, let us say the decoder is given a sample from uh, X condition on little y2. Just by looking at the sample, he knows that it has to come from this box. It cannot come from here, nor can it come from here. So it can identify y2. Okay. So it's really packing and non-overlapping boxes. That's why the name packing. And it turns out you can do this as long as n is about this order. Remember, it is two to the i epsilon min times delta. So the so the n is actually even less than this quantity. And here the n was greater than this quantity. So this is what we have learned so far to import. So any questions about it? If not, let's go to okay, let's go to one shot noisy channel. Okay. So a channel C maps an input symbol X to a probability distribution uh, P of Y given X on output symbols Y. And this we know. This is the one shot circuit. So the channel is used exactly once. If it's fed an input symbol X, it outputs a probability distribution on output symbols Y driven by this. So let's say I fix uh, some epsilon delta, less than one. And uh, I want to transmit uh, a message. So uh, I'm allowed two to the R messages. So R is what I'll call the weight. So let M be a message from one, two, three, up to two to the R. Okay? And let M be a uniformly random message. And what is R? R, I'll take to this point. Okay. So remember the channel fixes this conditional probability distribution P of Y given X. But of course the channel does not prescribe what, is, what distribution to take on the input symbol. So let us say I fix a probability distribution PX on the input symbol. So then I get a joint distribution on input and output symbols. So I get a joint distribution P of X comma Y, okay? which is nothing but PX times this condition. So with respect to this joint distribution, I can evaluate I epsilon min, okay? And uh, that's it. So I evaluate this, I can maximize this over all possible input distributions Px. And then there is this fudge additive term log by delta, which is okay. So let's call this quantity as R. Okay. And I now I claim that this rate is achieved. So what do I mean by that? Okay. So M is a uniformly random message from the set one, two, three, up to two to the R. Then there's a deterministic encoder E mapping M to a code word XM. Okay. So the code word is a particular symbol from the input alpha. Okay. So M is mapped to a particular code word, which I'll denote XM. It belongs to the input alpha X. Now this code word XM on passing through the channel C admits a private coin randomized decoder D. Okay. So note in my scheme, the encoder will be deterministic but the decoder will actually be private kind of text. So this decoder will output its guess m hat of the message m that was transmitted. And it turn out that probability that m hat is not equal to m, <clears throat> where the probability is calculated over the uniform choice of the message m, okay? And so once you fix the message, okay, you have deterministic encoding, no extra randomness there. But then the channel creates randomness, right? So, so the channel is fed xm, but it outputs a probability distribution y. So this channel creates some extra randomness. Then the output goes to a randomized decoder, which feeds in its own randomness. And after all this, I get m. So for all these randomnesses, from uh, the uniform choice of the uh, input message, okay, to the randomness of the channel, to the randomness of the decoding process, okay, average over all that if I calculate this probability, this should be less than epsilon plus n. Now it turns out that if I fix my rate to be this quantity, there exists such an encoding and decoding. And moreover, there's also weak converse, which almost matches it. Any private coin encoding and decoding strategy. So the converse holds even if I use randomized encoding uh, and randomized decoding. So any private coin randomized encoding and decoding strategy that fails with probability at most epsilon plus delta requires the rate to be smaller than this quantity. Okay. So, so it is the same i epsilon min, but okay, now it becomes i epsilon plus delta, so i epsilon, and it's maximized to a px. Note that the maximizing px here and the maximizing px here can be different, okay? So please be careful. That is because 
here it's epsilon plus delta and here it's epsilon. Okay, so this is what the theorem says. So ignoring this uh, delta complication, like we know basically the smooth max, uh, smooth uh, min mutual information, okay, is the achievable rate. So you can achieve this rate and there's a weak converse also saying that that's the best you can do if you want the probability of error to be small around that side. So any questions about the statement of the theorem? No? Okay, so let's try to prove it. So first we'll do the achievability, which is we'll show that this rate is achievable. So the achievability follows easily from the packing lemma and expectation. So what do we do? We just the usual thing. So choose a random code book of symbols, x1, x2, dot, dot, x2 to the r. So they are drawn IID from the marginal px. So what is this px? Remember, uh, in this expression, there's a maximization over the px's. So choose, uh, the probability of an input symbol to be from this maximizing probability distribution. So that is this marginal px. Okay. Choose the uh, two to the r iid samples x1 x2 dot x2 to the r from the marginal px. Okay. So that's the random code. And now, what is the channel doing? Like, uh, yeah. So the uh, encoding process is clear. Like, if I want to uh, send message number one, I'll just map it. To the code word x1. Message number two, I'll just map it to the code word x2. Okay. So it's a very simple deterministic encoding strategy. And uh, the channel, uh, let us say, if it is fed x1, will uh, produce some distribution on the output, which will be p of y given x1. Okay. If it was fed x2, it will be fed p of y given uh, x2. Now, because of the packing conditions, I know that these conditional probability distributions of the channel output y are almost destroyed for different uh, x's. Okay. So well, here's where I have a question. So this is related to the packing level. Mm -hmm. uh, so like a, yeah, yeah. So so uh, so this intuition, right, that things should be almost disjoint. Um, this sort of points to the um, uh, the what do you call it? The, the maximum likelihood formulation in the one shot setting where you know where you are defined that quantity where essentially instead of the the uh, a hypothesis testing f function we were only considering subsets okay but uh, because see we wanted con continuity also right so that's why we went to this hypothesis testing uh, the the the, mm -hmm. the f business right so but mm -hmm. then uh, uh, the the f really does not make things dis disjointed. I mean, for things to be disjoint, f itself has to look like uh, ones on a subset of the x's and zero on some other on 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 the complement. Mm -hmm. So, sure. uh, is that true? Is, is that actually how the uh, optimizing f looks? So the, Hello? so so the optimizing x. I mean, even if you're using uh, subsets, I mean, it will not in general be absolutely disjoint. Okay, okay. Okay, so I mean, that's- Yeah, there'll be some do. fudge, there'll be some small epsilon fudge. Yeah, yeah. so, but, but, but uh, I'll say almost disjoint because there's a decoder which can decode. It can decode from which conditional uh, probability distribution the output symbol Y is coming. Okay. But but you know if 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 uh, these were uh, almost disjoint, then I mean here's the question: why, why do we need a randomized decoder? Then why can't we have uh, more like a like a deterministic decoder? Because if the if the if, if the conditionals are almost disjoint, mm -hmm. then uh, I can sort of uh, just just look at the distributions and say that okay, their intersections are very very small in probability. Mm -hmm. And I can essen essentially ignore them and uh, and produce an F, which is essentially like uh, subsets, uh, which which points to subsets. Uh, you, you you understand what I'm saying, right? Yeah, understand. I mean, uh, I mean that's what you uh, do in the joint typicality decoding in the IAD. Yes. Yeah. yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So it's subsets, and I mean, it, then it's easier to see the subsets are almost disjoint. Surely, yeah. 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 So my question is, I can't, I, I can't see why, uh, where the uh, randomization. I mean, I know what the randomization is, so I can't see where the randomization really helps. That's that's the question. 
in the decoder you mean in the decoder yes why do i have to uh, accept with uh, probability f of x of n well i mean that that gives you a seemingly slightly better i mean of course all these rates are close to each other because i know i f seven min is uh, i mean uh, uh, any is close to any one of those other three quantities right 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 so okay, yeah. okay okay yeah yeah so 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 the so the point is that i mean uh, why do you want to restrict yourself by doing deterministic decoding if you do uh, randomized decoding you can take advantage of the linear programming formulation okay and then you get the con continuity yeah. property of, of okay okay yeah yeah but more than continuity the the uh, i mean you are allowed to do randomized decoding okay Randomized decoding is uh, captured by the linear program formulation. The linear program formulation beats any other formulation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, that's right. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't beat by so much because we know they are all close to each other. But uh, yes, that's it. okay. So if I mean, if you really want this rate, I epsilon min because I epsilon min uses uh, uh, private coin uh, randomized decoding. You have to. Use it if you if you want to get exactly this. That's it. Okay. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So okay. So let's further questions. More? No. Okay. So let's um, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, as I said, uh, you just apply the packing lemma. So now, unfortunately, in in the statement of packing lemma, I've interchanged x and y. Your so, uh, samples are coming from x and uh, the conditional distribution will be on y given little x. Doesn't matter. So you can apply the packing number, which will ensure that the expected probability of error for a uniformly chosen message, okay, is at most epsilon plus delta if r is given to be this quantity. Right? So remember what was the r for the packing number? R is delta times this. So that all I've done is I just taken, uh, I mean, n is two to the r, okay, and I've used this value of n out. So if, it, if you take logs, it starts looking like this. Okay, so, uh, so this is the expected probability of error. So the expectation is over the choice of the code book. Okay, and the error is over uniformly chosen message. Okay, so it's at most epsilon plus delta for R given error. Now fix one such code book once and for all. So now the for this fixed code book, the average probability of error over a uniformly chosen message is at most epsilon plus delta. Okay. And we are going to stop here for this theorem, but if you want, you can. Uh, go ahead and uh, make the worst case probability of error uh, 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 less than maybe twice epsilon plus delta, and uh, you, you you lose just one bit in the rate and things like that. Okay, so the expurgation step that if you want to do, you can do it up. Okay, but we will not bother in this course. But yes, at least for uh, this point to point one shot noisy channel coding, you can even ensure that the worst case error is small and the rate is roughly this. Maybe minus one. So note that the encoder is deterministic, as we discussed, but the decoder is private coin randomized simply because we are using the i epsilon min to design our decoder. Okay. okay. So let's go ahead. So that was achievability. Yeah. Okay. And now I want to prove the converse. Just a second. Huh? Hello. Uh, yeah. Hi. He's got a call, is it? I just I was just trying to. Yeah, yeah. I think he's got a call. Uh, okay.
So, yeah. Sorry about that. Mm, uh, okay. So let's try to prove the converse. So that follows from the data processing input. We have seen several converses so far. Okay, so we're trying to prove this quantity. So now suppose there are private coin encoding and decoding procedures, E and B, giving overall error probability at most epsilon. Okay. So put the uniform probability distribution on the message set. So I am getting some rate, let us say R, so the number of messages is 2TR. Let's put the uniform probability distribution on the message set. So that means the uh, probability of one particular message little name is 2 to the minus R. For all. Now let's consider the Markov chain. Okay, so the Markov chain starts from the message random variable, which is uniform. It goes to the encoder. Remember the encoder has a private coin, so it can add its own randomness. And then I get a probability distribution, like for, for a fixed message uh, little m, okay? I can get a probability distribution over code words, P of x given n. Then the channel acts on the input alphabet. So for a fixed code word x, the channel creates a probability distribution, the output set will y. Okay, and then uh, one goes to a decoding process. Okay, so that's also a, a randomized procedure. So for a fixed output symbol y, the decoder will output a probability distributions on m hat. So m hat is morally supposed to be the guess for the messenger. Okay, and I claim that there is uh, for this rate r. Okay, I don't know what it is. But there is a private coin encoding decoding strategy so that this entire Markov chain, that means this kind of probability distribution, uh, gives me uh, the error probability, which is the probability that n is not equal to n hat, to be less than epsilon. Now, observe that this immediately tells me the following. So look at this underlying probability distribution. Look at the joint probability distribution at the two ends. I just have one question. So. Uh... We have uh, before before doing all this, we have uh, what are our assumptions? The assumptions is that uh, are that uh, th there is a protocol uh, as in uh, this randomized encoder and randomized decoder both are private coin, hmm. which uh, achieves this low probability of an epsilon, and the joint distribution that uh, uh, script T and script D create on the system X Y is P X Y. These are our assumptions, right? Yes. Yes. So uh, yeah. So the error probability is epsilon. So the error probability I'm uh, I'm measuring over the uniform choice of messages. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Oh, as right. error probability over uniform choice of messages, and there is this yeah. uh, one more assumption that the marginal on x is p x, uh, as in the strategy no, no, no. creates. Uh, uh, no, no. So no more assumption. Assumption is the error probability is measured for the uniform choice of messages. You can use worst case probability that can only help our argument. Okay. 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 But the weakest argument I'm telling you, the error probability is epsilon over the uniform choice of messages. But of course, in the error probability, like there are other sources of randomness that comes in. So uniform choice of message is one, but then there's randomized encoding, randomized decoding, and randomization of the channel. So there's this entire Markov chain occurring. Okay? And this Markov chain is creating this kind of probability distribution. Okay, so I've, I've written a probability distribution over the alphabet n comma x comma y comma m hat. Right, right. Okay, okay. Yeah, got it. Okay. So, now, uh, what do I know? I know that if I look at the probability distribution on M and M hat, the two endpoints, okay? So, uh, M is equal to M hat uh, uh, with probability at least one minus X. So, this immediately tells me that R, okay, is uh, less than I epsilon min of M, M hat under P. So remember P is this distribution. Now, why is that? The, look at the very simple hypothesis test, right? If, if, if I want to say that uh, this I epsilon mean is larger than R, I have to find a hypothesis test, okay? Which succeeds with probability at least one minus epsilon for the joint distribution, PMM, the joint distribution coming from here. And uh, for the product of the marginals on M and M hat, it should succeed with probability less than two to the minus. Okay, that, that's what I want uh, to prove this in equality. So I said there's a very simple hypothesis test. So the hypothesis test is just checking if m equal to m. Okay. Now because of the correctness of this procedure, I know this simple hypothesis test succeeds with probability at least one minus epsilon for the joint distribution. Okay. And what happens if I look at the product of the marginals? 
So I don't know what the marginal on M hat is. It's something weird. But I know what is the marginal on M. The marginal on M is, is uniform. Okay. So now you can check that if you have a distribution. The error is actually uh, yeah, one over M. Yeah. So, so, you, 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 uh, so you can prove the following. Like if you have a distribution which is uniform of M on M, uh, tensor with uh, some uh, uh, like uh, unknown one or some any, arbitrary distribution. Any of arbitrary hat. distribution. Any, yeah, arbitrary any arbitrary. Yeah. And I do the test of m equal to m hat. Okay. This equality test. So the equality test will succeed probably exactly two to the minus half. Okay. So yeah. again, fail, 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 fail with uh, two to the. No, no. It will succeed with probably two to the minus half. And fail with one minus two to the negative. So the equality no, it test succeeds with probability one minus epsilon, right? The equality test no, no, succeeds with no. one minus epsilon, fails with no, one no. over so, m. So you are confused. So there are two things. The equality test succeeds with probability one minus epsilon for the joint distribution on M M, the joint distribution coming from this basis. Okay. So that is from the correctness of the proof. But consider the other distribution, which is uniform on M. Tensor that means independently some arbitrary on M hat. On this product distribution, okay, it does not matter what is the distribution M hat, but what matters oh, is okay, okay, I see. I the see, distribution I see. M is uniform. So on a product distribution, the equality test succeeds with probability exactly two to the minus half. Here we are using that. Okay. okay. So the equality test suffices to prove this inequality because. The equality test succeeds for the joint distribution with probability one minus F7, correctness of the protocol. And the equality test succeeds for the product distribution with probability two to the minus. Yeah. So, so that proves this inequality. So now let's start the data crossing business. So R is less than I epsilon here. Okay. Now, because the Markov chain property, right? So, uh, so uh, look at this quantity x y. I can do data processing on x and come to m. Okay, Th that is that is the reverse process. Okay, so from x I can go to m, from y I can go to m hat. Okay, so two application data processing gave me this inequality. Okay, so this is evaluated over p. What is p? P is this distribution, but of course it will be less than the maximization over. Uh, all possible input probability distribution. So this P is prescribing a distribution on X, Px. Okay. So let us I just maximize over all Px's and then evaluate this I epsilon B, it will only be large. Okay. So that's it. So this finally shows that R is less than max over Px I epsilon. And here is just epsilon plus delta because I want to match this. Okay. Any questions? So it pays to pause and think about each step and the beauty of this entire process. Okay. So, so first, so this step is reminiscent. So if you look at the converse proof in uh, this asymptotic IID case, okay, the weak converse of uh, Shannon's uh, noisy channel coding theorem, the asymptotic IID case. So this particular uh, uh, thing was Fano's inequality. Okay, so the, the same thing M M hat. So, but then because you, uh, like I really want to write the mutual information between M M hat, so I have to write R minus some uh, like error epsilon times the alphabet size, some nonsense like that. But uh, that that uh, that fudge of minus epsilon times the alphabet size is gone simply because I'm using a smoother uh, mutual information quantity. So that's taken care of. So the Fano part is trivial out here. The alphabet size doesn't matter because I've simply smoothed the equation. So that's the first difference and the first advantage. So this difference is to the one shot advantage. So I get this. Okay. And then the data processing was there even uh, in the asymptotic IID. Okay. So, so this part is fine. Okay. And then of course, uh, maximizing or input distribution student, that was also there. But what was there in the asymptotic IID, which we have brushed under the carpet here, which is not applicable to one shot is, remember, if, I, if I'm doing asymptotic IID, I'll be doing this not over x, y, but over x to the power n, y to the power n. 
Remember, in the asymptotic ID case, the channel is used not once, but n times. So now the in, uh, input alphabet is not x, but x to the power n. Okay? n tuples made out of x. So I should maximize this over an arbitrary probability distribution over x to the power n. Okay? Then the channel x in memoryless fashion, fine. But uh, I get a joint probability distribution between x to the n and y to the n. I have to evaluate my mutual information quantity with respect to this. And then there was a clever proof, which used chain rule and some other business, which showed that this quantity, maximization over Pxn of this mutual information, the channel mutual information, is basically less than n times the maximization over one copy. So that part is missing here simply because, I mean, uh, we are uh, not talking of n users at all. Okay, so we just stop here. So though this looks good, like, I want to point out that we are actually ignoring an important part. Like if, if I would apply this theorem, okay, and I, I say, no, I want to get uh, exactly what Shannon did. Like in the asymptotic IID case, I want to get the uh, achievability. So achievability is simple, right? So, I mean, if I, if I was doing achievability here, okay, it's uh, uh, the one shot says I can maximize what the, uh, an arbitrary probability distribution on X to the n for so joint probability distribution evaluate this. But for achievability, I can say, okay, I, I don't want to maximize over a joint probability distribution on x, uh, x to the n. I will take a probability distribution on x and just take an IID copy of it. So that will only lower this maximization. So I will just say that, fine, I'll settle for a slightly lower achievable rate. So R is greater than max. So I'll, I'll still keep a Px here, but then I will put. Uh, n independent copies of px in x to the n here, get something on y to then evaluate this quantity. And then we saw, uh, I mean, at least we remarked in the very first lecture that uh, uh, these quantities, uh, like, uh, and of very first lecture and from time to time, that these quantities go to n times the mutual information. So, so this shows, the, my one-shot analysis shows that r greater than n times the mutual information is an achievable rate. But it does not show that R is less than n times the um, mutual information maximized over Px. So this does not quite show it because I have to stop here at Px to be. So do you appreciate this difference? No, wait a second. Wait a second. So so uh, is is it not so so? Uh, I can simply when I am doing the NID copy thing. I can simply take that as a as a big channel, right? As one super channel, and I can repeat this proof for that super channel, and say that okay, this upper bound then will be a maximization over all joint distributions over the input, i min epsilon x to the n y to the n. That sure. is true, right? That part is true. That is achievable. So let me write down what what you wrote. So. No, no, e even if I'm doing the converse, even if I'm doing the converse, I'm saying that when you're doing the converse, I can, I can say, say, say the following thing. I can repeat this whole converse proof for that one channel, for that one channel, which is hmm. yeah, essentially but, uh, P but, y but given yeah. x over to the tensor power n. No, no, but if I repeat the converse proof, you'll get Px to the n now. Yes, yes. I'll, 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 I'll get a big joint distribution Px to them. So I won't get uh, tensor copies Px. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I, so you cannot say that this is less than n times uh, the maximization over a single copy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's a problem. You have to stop here. So I, so I'll just write that. So just one point here, I think that the uh, distinction that Pranab mentioned is actually important because what happens in the uh, multi-terminal case is that uh, in many of the channels, right, in uh, broadcast uh, or interference, you are able to show n letter converses for Han Kobayashi, for Mart and all that. But the issue is that uh, Pxn cannot be broken down into Px tensor n. And Correct. hence the converses are loose. So it turns out in the point to point case, it goes through, but uh, that is an important, uh, that's actually an important distinction that uh, uh, that Pranam pointed to. And I I am just curious, what can we, can we not leverage this idea for doing some 
slightly stronger converses in the case of uh, multi terminal channels I, i don't know i might be hitting on the wrong thing but i i wouldn't work too much on the converses for network channels like broadcast and uh, uh, interference but i would be interested to know uh okay so uh, yeah so so you're right is, is my okay. comment clear well it's clear to me uh, is it clear to the others yeah. so um, uh, the, the, the point is exactly here so let me uh, try to make it clearer so this is uh, okay so this is not less than n times max in fact in in yeah. fact uh, if 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 you repeat this proof then the upper bound we are getting is uh, is potentially larger right because we are maximizing uh, not over the sub subset of tensor uh, tensor power n input distributions but over all joint distributions yes, over yes. the so, input so, so the inequality goes in the wrong direction yeah yeah exactly exactly so in some if you look at it in some level the biggest i mean one of the biggest upshots of shannon's work is the fact that it factorizes as n times yes. uh, and that doesn't happen yes. in multi terminal channels so that that so he essentially reduced their multi in infinite dimensional optimization problem into a single dimensional optimization problem so that yes. can be viewed as one uh, one important yes. thing yes of course yes so that's what so so in the one shot case So, so that's the problem with the one shot uh, uh, theory that uh, i mean often uh, uh, converses look uh, very uh, cute to look at but the thing is that uh, if you apply these converses to the asymptotic iid setting these are n letter converses okay because you will be uh, maximizing or minimizing over joint distributions on input alphabets but now the input alphabet is looks like x to the power n okay so Uh, in general, like you will not be able to reduce it to n times the optimization over a single alpha. Okay. I mean, and the, the problem exists in the good old IRD theory also. Like single letter converses are not known for many multi-terminal channels, or the converse are loose. Okay. I mean, there are single letter upper uh, outer bounds, but they are loose. Okay. So in fact, uh, this point becomes important already at the multiple access channel. So one can give a very uh, short and sweet. Uh, Multi-letter converse or a one-shot converse for the uh, multiple access channel, and it's tight. I mean that. Uh, who is signed in here? Hello, do you still hear me? Uh, I can hear you. I don't know about the others. I don't know who signed me uh, out here. Nobody should be logging in at this time. Come on. I don't see anyone else. There were four of us, and uh, no, no, somebody has logged in with this account. Oh, so, okay. Let me, let me log in again for that person. Now the the point is okay. Now this. Business seems to have interrupted the recording. Let's see, there's something going on. Okay, so I'm still audible. Hopefully, this is still being recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. See that later. Yeah. So, so already for the uh, simplest multi-terminal channel, uh, the multiple access channel, you can uh, give a one shot or a multilateral converse which looks very cute very simple and in fact tight at the multilateral level but uh, that formula does not reduce to n times a single letter formula okay. whereas uh, what is usually taught in course is the pentagonal region for the multiple access channel okay does reduce to a single letter formula and it also happens to be tight for for that channel so so those are issues so when you are doing one shot theory it is nice but you should also ha always have an eye on uh, what happens in the asymptotic iid case and can you go down to a, a reasonable single letter formula from there okay. so yeah, oh, one last question oh, one last question so what about in the 
So in the multiple axis channel, it's fine because you have uh, you don't have any auxiliary alphabets. But suppose you go to a circumstance like where a degraded broadcast channel where a converse has been shown with an auxiliary alphabet. Mm-hmm. What happens in that circumstance? Uh, is the one letter uh, is it possible to develop such kind of a converse with the auxiliary alphabet or? So I, mean, I, don't I don't know. know. I'll, I don't know. Let me look at that. Okay. So yeah, for for the multiple access channel, I mean, you can then uh, go down from the one shot to the uh, single letter, I suppose. So at least for the point to point, we are going to see how to do it. Okay. So uh, 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 at the present moment, what I've shown so far does not show how you go to n times the single letter. Okay. But it turns out, at least for point to point, you can do it. I, I would guess you can do it for multiple access channel also. Yeah, others I'll have to see. Uh, I don't know. And I wouldn't I mean, spend much time at this angle. Sure, sure. Thank you. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So the point being that, I mean, if, if I'd applied this to the asymptotic IID case, I would have got a maximization over the. Yeah. So, and then I, I would have got a maximization. Here. PXN of uh... Uh, Pranab, maybe uh, this is just a suggestion, but I think Hari Krishnan, he's first or second year, right? I think he's not asking any questions. So maybe uh, he should be yeah, asked yeah. whether he's understanding or yeah, not. Yeah, because yeah. the rest of us are <laughs> really practicing, but he's not practicing. So, yeah, Hari so Actually, yeah, I mean, uh, so I'm getting like few parts here and there. and like I go back and watch this again and I get it better. Wait, uh, were you here for the last lecture? Hare Krishna? Yeah, yes. Yeah, I think you joined later, but you were there till the end. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you could also use the discussion channel to ask questions and doubts. It's, it's there for that. And, uh, Okay, so the, so let's come back to this point. But I would like to, uh, yeah, ensure that I mean you understand that. So, the if I apply this to the asymptotic IID, I'll get a formula like max over a joint distribution on the input alphabet, which is now p x to the n, okay, of mutual information whatever kind on x to the n and y to the n. So that is not, uh, I mean, uh, as such, you cannot say that this is less than n times the maximization over a single axis. You cannot say that this is n times the maximization over a single alphabet. So that's what that's what we are talking about. Okay. In fact, uh, the inequality goes in the other direction. I know that this maximization is larger than n times the maximization over a single alphabet. So that kind of uh, uh, makes things counterintuitive or difficult. That uh, in reality, I mean, for this maximization, in some sense, okay, I've not made it fully precise that. Uh, I don't have to look at joint distributions on the input alphabet, just uh, uh, I can take the maximum distribution over one copy of the input alphabet and take an independent copy. Of it. So, but as you can see, that will require work. That required work even in Shannon's proof and will require work in our standard proof. Okay. Any further comments? Okay, so let's go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so uh let's look at a defined converse and the main reason we are doing it is because we want to go to the asymptotic iid circle okay and try to finally go down to uh, maximization over a single copy that's what is called a single letter converse okay so uh, so can i just ask one thing so in mm-hmm. channels so i'm familiar with converses so, uh, in channels proof how did it go so you had nr that was greater yeah. than or equal to uh, uh, the the entropy of the messages. That is H M to the N, which is equal to H M N, uh, N times H M or whatever. This is uh, greater than or equal to uh, like mutual information between M and M hat plus uh, some extra thing. Then you use yeah. a fano, right? Then there was a no, fano. No, the, the, yeah, yeah. So no, that was the fano. Yeah, the, the fano is just 
for this part. All that is shows that R is less than the mutual information between M and M hat. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. Plus something. Right. Right. And and that something looks like epsilon times the alphabet. Okay. Or what if some function yes. of epsilon times the alphabet? Yes. Yes. <laughs> so actually, it is uh, well the alphabet. Yeah, log so, of the alphabet. Log, log, log of the alphabet. alphabet. Log of the alphabet. So it is n epsilon, uh, like n from epsilon or some small function of epsilon times uh, the uh, alphabet size mod x. So that's what it looks. But remember, then this was n r. So if I divide by n, then divide by uh, n and everything, you can take yeah, epsilon so, to see zero and uh, that alphabet so, number. Yeah. So you first divide by n and then let epsilon go to zero. So if you just divide exactly. by n, it is uh, like uh, I mean this quantity. Uh, mutual information plus, divided by n, yeah, plus, plus it, some it epsilon log mod x, yeah. So, so this was the final part. This data processing is the same, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Then this maximization is also the same, it is trivially there, okay. But then yeah. that will give maximization of px to the n. Then you start uh, using the chain rule to break up this mutual information, okay, okay, okay. And when you do that, at one point, you use a memoryless property, and then you realize that uh, this maximization is already attained by taking just one distribution on X, okay, the best distribution on X, and then taking any independent copies of that. So that is the property of the of the chain rule and the memorylessness, you're saying? Yes. This, uh, so, this observation so, that going yeah, from yeah. joint distributions to product. Yeah, so I have to, uh, so these are n copies, right? So I have to break it, the chain rule will break it up into n terms, but each term is now over one copy. Yeah, each term will be a, there will be conditionings over yeah. the other copies. Yeah, but so then you say that, condition. okay. Yeah, then you say that, okay, look, this is a, this is a memoryless thing. So hmm. this conditioning uh, doesn't matter. That's not, that's not entirely clear, right? Because the input distribution, even though it might be memoryless, uh, at most, so, so what you look at say, the proof. Yeah. Okay. Go and look okay. at the, the conditioning yeah. helps, and uh, you can say that yeah. So, so uh, suppose you are looking at the ith copy, so that it will look like mutual information between x i and y i, okay, conditioned mm -hmm. on uh, x one to x i minus one. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then you say that I'm using the memoryless behavior of the channel at the ith copy. Okay. So you can say that uh, as long as I'm doing maximization, the conditioning does not work. Of course, the conditioning affects distributions, but if I have to do maximization, the conditioning does not help the maximization. Okay. So then you say that, okay, the best that I can do is I maximize over one copy. I maximize over the ith copy, uh, ignoring the conditioning. I maximize over the i plus one f copy, ignoring the condition, so on and so on. So that just means okay. I do okay, n times the maximization over one copy. Okay, so this is how the proof goes. Okay. So, so, yeah. I mean, uh, there is cleverness in one. You have to use the chain rule. But uh, I'm just trying to see how you will do it for the one shot. If, if I can get any yeah, it's, tools. It's, 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 it's not easy. I mean, from here, we don't have a ch uh, chain rule for I Excel and main. And, uh, then right. uh, there is also the I mean, conditioning business and things like that. So we'll see. Okay. okay. So let's. Uh, So let's go ahead. Yeah. So we have to work towards the uh, asymptotic IID. So for that, let us first prove a refined converse for the one shot. So any private coin randomized encoding and decoding strategy that fails with probability of most epsilon plus delta requires the rate to be less than this. So remember earlier, I just had to go back R less than maximization over Px of this. I epsilon plus delta mean. So I epsilon plus delta mean means that it is D epsilon plus delta mean of the joint distribution with respect to the product of the margins. It will be Px times Py. But now I'm doing something strange. I'm forgetting the Py. I said I replace Py by Qy and do a minimization for Qy. So this quantity, okay. So this right-hand side is in general lower than the right-hand side out here. Okay, because here, I'm not allowed to use a QI, I have to use the PY. But, but now if I minimize over QI, it means the right hand side lower. But I claim that this is still a converse. Okay, it's defined because it's a seemingly tighter converse. 
So R should be less than this. So this is what I'm now going to do. Okay. And now if you say for achievability, R is uh, uh, like, then, I mean, this minimization will only make your achievability worse. Okay. So for achievability, like uh, uh, I would like to keep the same uh, PY out here, right? I mean, I don't want to uh, replace PY by QI and minimize it. So for so my achievability, I would like to keep it to that quantity, but I want to tighten the context. But you can sort of see that you cannot tighten it so much because I mean, whatever this R is, it has to be larger than the achievability. So you can get a little bit of leeway by this plus delta, maybe a little bit of leeway by this QI instead of PY, but not so much. So let's proceed. So suppose the private point encoders and decoders giving error probability at most epsilon, just as before. Put the uniform distribution on the message set again as before. And remember the underlying distribution is P of M, which was uniform. Then the uh, condition on a message that the probability distribution of code words, so this is coming from the encoding step. Then condition on a code word, there's a probability distribution over the output alphabet. This is coming from the channel. And then condition on the channel output, there's a probability distribution over the guesses of the message and have. So this is coming from the decoder. So this was the joint probability distribution P. Now, for ease of notation, let us define what I would call the directed smooth hypothesis testing mutual information. Why directed? The usual uh, hypothesis testing mutual information, or I mean the usual, uh, like d epsilon min, is a symmetric quantity. I mean, d epsilon min of pxy is the same as d epsilon min of pyx. I mean, uh, right? I mean, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can see that. I mean. If I put in PY out here, I mean, it doesn't matter whether I write X first, Y next, or the other. So that's a symmetric thing. So, I mean, in our language, I'll say that the mutual information between X and Y is same as the mutual information between Y, y and X. So this is true for the smooth I mean. Okay, So of course, true for the Shannon, but it's also true for the smooth I mean. But in the direct one, that's no longer true. So that's why I'm changing notation and writing X semicolon Y to point out that there is some direction, there is some asymmetry out here. So what is this? So take d epsilon min of the joint distribution pxy, okay? And uh, uh, for the second distribution, use px, so that's the marginal, times qy, okay? So the symmetric definition, the undirected definition would have used a py out here, but I'll use a qy and I'll minimize the word p. So basically, this quantity is the directed mutual information. Okay, so this is the, this is just the definition for my ease. And now let, let us say I find a minimizing QI in this expression. So P is coming from here. I fix it once and for all coming from my protocol. Now uh, I've uh, found a minimizing Q for this definition. So we can define the following distribution. So choose a message N according to P, that means choose a message N uniformly at random pass it through the encoding, so that gives me P of X given N. But now, ignore the action of the channel, okay? Independently, take a, a sample from the channel output according to QY, that is this QY. Pass it through the decoder and I'll get Q of M hat given one. So this is also probability distribution of the same alphabet as this. So basically the action of the channel has been removed, okay? So in other words, if I look at M and X, they're independent of Y and N. Okay, so there is a independence or tensor product between the P and the Q of T. Okay. So why is this good? Let's see. Now, suppose I want to look at this uh, relative entropy, like D epsilon mean of P M M hat. So P M M hat is coming from here. Okay. With respect to P M tensor Q M hat. Okay. So Q M hat is coming from here. Okay. And of course P M is so, so really, if you take this distribution, as I just said, this distribution is product on mx on one side and uh, uh, y m hat on the other side. Okay. So if I take this distribution and uh, look at its margin on m m hat, it will look like this, pm uh, times q m hat. Now I claim that my rate r is still less than d epsilon. Okay. So of course, earlier I had argued that this was two when I had uh, PM hat out here, but I claim that this is true even with QM hat. 
Even if I take this minimizing to M hat, this is true. Why is this? So you the same hypothesis test, M equal to M hat. That succeeds with probability one minus epsilon for the joint distribution, I know that. And over the product distribution, uh, what I said before, I emphasize again. So look at uh, the equality hypothesis test applied to any distribution which is uniform on M times some arbitrary thing on M hat, doesn't matter. That will succeed with probability exactly two to the minus. Okay. So, the, so the same reasoning says that R is less than this. Okay. So now I can apply data processing. So R is less than this, but, but now I'm looking at I epsilon uh, mean the directed mutual function, which was this quantity, right? And remember the QI is the minimizing. So if I look at this relative entropy and apply data processing from X, I can get M as before, okay? And from uh, Y, I can get M hat by the decoder action okay, as before. So if I start with X, Y and apply the reverse encoder and the forward decoder, I'll get PMM hat, not surprising. I start with X, Y and I'm going here, okay? I'm, uh, I'm going from X to M here and I'm going from Y to M hat out here. Okay, so from PXY, I'll go to PMM hat. Now, if I start from PX tensor Q1, okay, basically I'm starting from this distribution. From X, I'll go to M. From Y, I will go to M hat. Okay, so the distribution that we'll get starting from PX times QY is PM times QM hat. Okay. Fine, data processing I can use, it's less than this. And then I can maximize over the input probability distribution. I still have the directed output. And that's exactly what I want. As the uh, defined concepts. Okay. So, any questions? Okay. So, let's uh, proceed. Okay. So, I mean, it looks a little uh, unnerving that I mean, I, I can minimize over QI, but yeah, I mean, that's how the mathematics goes. But you, we will see the power of this step. So now we want to uh, go to the asymptotic IID settings. So actually, I should say strong converse for uh, not one shot, but uh, asymptotic IID. Okay. So uh, what strong converse for IID noisy channel code. So, okay. So what do I mean by this? So the achievable theorem for the one shot noisy channel coding has a weak converse, which we just saw, the, the defined weak converse. So it's a one shot weak converse. So why do I call it weak converse all the time? Weak converse just guarantees that if I take a rate R larger than this bound, then the error will be larger than epsilon. Right? If you want error less than epsilon, the rate has to be less than this. So if you take a rate larger than this, error will be bigger than epsilon. So that, that's why it's called a weak converse, so, which means that for larger rates, the error will be more than epsilon. But what we want is, we want an even larger rate R prime where, where the error will jump to one minus epsilon. Remember, epsilon is a small quantity, like maybe 0 0.001 or something like that. Okay. So uh, saying that the error is more than 0 0.001 is not very interesting to us. We would like to say that the error is more than one minus 0 0.001. Okay. So we want to see at what rate R prime, the error will jump to one minus epsilon for any product. Okay. And this rate R prime will be called a strong converse. Now state in this language, it's clear that R prime is bigger than R. So R is the weak converse rate where the error is uh, epsilon. R prime is the strong converse rate where the error is one minus epsilon or higher. Yes. Of course, you would expect that R prime is larger than R. Okay. So we want to know how much larger it is. Okay. So is this part clear? Okay. So strong converse rate is not an achievable rate. Achievable rates, we only want achievability for epsilon error. Okay, and achievability for one minus epsilon error is not so interesting, but uh, really speaking, when you are talking strong converse rates, I'm talking of the error regime of one minus epsilon. Okay. So, okay, okay so, uh, so, uh, so for R prime, we want error one minus epsilon. So already what we know, we know that R prime is larger than this quantity. This just comes in the refined converse, but I'm replacing epsilon by one minus epsilon. 
Okay, so we already know that a rate R prime larger than this will give error one hundred percent. Same reasoning as before. Okay, and we also know that if the rate R goes slightly smaller than this, the error will be less than one minus epsilon because of HE weight. I mean, remember HE weight and weak converts are very close to each other. And there is some fudge of delta, but that's about it. Okay, so so really, I mean, what is this telling us? This is telling us that the weak converse rate will have an epsilon here. The strong converse rate will have a one minus epsilon. But uh, for our later purposes, I, once I one minus epsilon, I want to uh, change the notation d min and make it d max. So remember, we had a theorem earlier on that d min with error one minus epsilon is roughly d max with error epsilon. Okay? So I invoke that theorem. So this says that any protocol with rate r prime larger than this one. So I've just replaced d min by d max, and I'm using the exact theorem, so the fudges of delta will come. So any protocol whose rate r prime is larger than this, okay, so this quantity is larger than this, so which in turn will imply that the error is greater than one minus six. Okay. So now I'm going to study this quantity. So what have we learned from this discussion? That as long as my error requirement is less than epsilon, I can achieve rates up to this quantity, close to this quantity. I can get close to this quantity and I cannot go beyond this quantity. I know that. Now, if I if the error sh uh, should increase from epsilon to one minus epsilon, there's actually a smooth increasing rate from this quantity to this quantity, which was not clear in the asymptotic IID analysis. Okay, so people who have seen strong converse in asymptotic IID, they'll say, oh, come on, the mutual information is also a strong converse rate. Like if you have to go to a rate larger than the mutual information, the error will jump close to one. Okay. But uh, we will see that, I mean, uh, the reality is more subtle. Okay? And uh, the asymptotic ID analysis is hiding some subtleties. So we will have a, a deeper understanding of the subtleties today. So at the one shot level, we can clearly see that there is an increasing in rate as the error increases from epsilon to one minus epsilon. And now we'll see what this picture looks like in the asymptotic ID. So this was all one shot analysis, but then we will uh, apply the same formulas, but now I have, I have alphabet X to the N, Y to the N, and we'll see what this picture looks like, what this increase uh, in rate looks like. So any questions about the plan for the rest of the lecture? Uh, uh, this is a continuous increase because of the continuity of D min and D max in epsilon, right? Well, D min, right? Demon, from yeah, yeah. This D min is continuous in epsilon, so it smoothly. It's a continuous in, yeah. Okay. So now we'll see, I mean, how smooth or how fast it is once I evaluate this D epsilon min for the asymptotic ID level. Okay. Yeah. So, one, yeah. Just, just one question. So, uh, all this I could have also done without bringing, bringing in the refined converse. I mean, all, all this argument is still true when I say PX tensor PY, but somewhere later in yes, the proof, yes. it, this QY yes. will uh, be necessary. Yes, so, so far, yeah. It, uh, I mean, it has not made its important strength, but it will use. Good, more comments? Okay, not that's good. So let's start. So observe that the distribution. So we uh, like uh, we will we'll still look at the one shot for some more time. So observe that the distribution p x y, the joint distribution, is a convex combination of these distributions. Okay? So what is this distribution? Fix a symbol little x. Okay. Look at the probability distribution which gives probability mass one on little x and zero s. So I'm calling that one subscript x. Okay. So it's a single point probability distribution on the alphabet x. Tensor, uh, the distribution on y coming from the condition. So this is the distribution on y condition when uh, x is equal to little x. So a bunch of this distribution, one distribution for every little x. And now if I take a convex combination of these distributions of these probability vectors with coefficients px, I'll get this probability vector px. Is this clear to everybody? So this joint distribution is a convex combination of these probability distributions. So similarly, the distribution px times qy is a convex combination of these probability distributions. So these are the 
uh, just like before. So this is the single point distribution uh, concentrated on middle X. And here, this is QY. I mean, I mean this was independent, right? So fixing uh, X equal to little X has no effect on Y. But if I take a convex combination of these distributions with the same coefficient PX, I will get PX times Q. Okay. Now I'll use the joint convexity of D epsilon max. So remember, how do you prove joint convexity? We prove it from the data processing inequality. And ultimately, all our data processing inequality just say that if I discard a register, the distinguishability goes down, the relative entropy goes down. So we had seen this proof for the Shannon relative entropy, but exactly the same proof will work for D epsilon max. Okay. So we had argued the data processing should hold for D epsilon max. Let's put it. Joint convexity holds. So now I look at D epsilon max of this. So, so remember, okay, when I was here, I was just talking about the increase in D epsilon min to D1 minus epsilon, right? This increase here. But then I said I can replace the second quantity D min 1 minus epsilon by D max of epsilon. So now you'll see the power of this replacement. So I mean, uh, like this quantity upper bounds are demon because the inequality has to go in the right direction. So it look look like I'm losing something, but don't worry. We will see the power of this translation of working with uh, D max. So I'm basically evaluating D epsilon max for this distribution. Pxy, the joint distribution with respect to Px times Py, the product of the margins. Now, by the joint convexity property, I can say that this is less than, so that the relative entropy of the average is less than the average of the relative entropy. So that I can say. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. So now I can do my max min business. Remember my uh, uh, refined converse, right? The refined converse had this max min, max over uh, Px, min over Py. So I'm just sort of max over px min over two at this. So now this okay is a uh, yeah. So uh, so I'm applying it out here. So uh, ah sorry yeah. So uh, wait a minute yeah. So max over px min over two at d epsilon max. If I apply to this one. Now I'm interchanging the min and the max out here. Now here is something you should always know that max of min for any quantity is less than min of max. Okay. So you may have seen it in LP duality, this is called the weak duality theorem, but these are all very trivial statements. So you don't need linearity or anything. Max of min is always less than min of max. So you can, you can check by finding an X star and a Y star, which H is the maximum and the minimum and working through the inequality. Okay. So I've interchanged uh, this, so I get this inequality. Max min is less than min max. Okay. But now what have I got? So min qi, I keep as it is, but max over px, d epsilon max. Okay. So now I use the joint convexity out here. Okay. Now, so I know that d epsilon max is less than uh, the convex combination of these quantities with coefficients px. So once I have a convexity relation like this, if I, if I want to maximize this, I'll just pick the X naught, which maximizes this quantity out. Okay. So now I can ignore the probability distribution PX, the maximization occurs at a particular point X, or in other words, the maximization occurs at a concentrated probability distribution, which is concentrated on one little X. Okay. So I, I, I put in that little X, and now, I mean, this first part doesn't matter. I mean, this concentrated distribution literally doesn't matter. So all the relative entropy is coming from Y. So, uh, so I, I fixed a symbol X. So now look at the relative entropy between PY uh, given X equal to little X with respect to PY. Is this step clear? Okay, yeah. So first one is always true. Max min is less than min max. The second one comes from joint convexity. This equality. Okay, so now let's start evaluating. So, so far this was one shot. Okay, everything was one shot. But this is where we... Uh, now enter the asymptotic IID set. So we'll take this quantity. Uh, well, sorry for here, we'll take this quantity, but now we are going to evaluate it for asymptotic IID. So now it will be max over the input distribution P on X to the N. And remember, this could be a joint probability distribution. Nothing stops. 
Now, minimization of, of Q over Y to the end. Again, a joint probability distribution, nothing stops it. And then this relative entropy. Okay, so this is the relative entropy on X and Y n coming from the channel action. The tensor product of two, uh, uh, product of two prob uh, probability distributions. Okay. Yeah. So in the asymptotic IID case, this left hand side just looks like this. And what you see that this is less than or equal to this quantity. So it's min over Q Y n max over one particular end tuple XN of this one. Okay. So now this is a probability distribution over Y to the N. Okay, this is another probability distribution over Y. Now, yeah. yeah. So now what I'm going to do is, Remember, at the very outset, there's a minimization of a joint probability distributions Q on YN. I will say that I don't want to minimize your joint probability distributions on YN. I'll take one probability distribution Y, okay? And I'll take N independent copies of it. So in the second place out here, I will take N independent copies of QY. Okay, so now it's just over a single uh, 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 copy of the alphabet. Okay, so minimizing over uh, a joint distribution on Y is uh, less than minimizing over a uh, tensor product distribution okay, on Y. So that's what I'm doing. Okay. So take QY on a single copy of Y. Now take N independent copies of it for Y. But for this maximization, it's some extent. Okay, so that explains this in inequality. And now we have a further upper bound, and this is the hardest part. So I claim that this is less than n times, okay? So min over qy, and now I'm doing maximization not over an n tuple, but over just one copy. Okay. So just one symbol x. So now I'm looking at uh, probability distribution not over y to the n, but over y. Okay, condition probability distribution of y. Okay, then qy out here. And then the factor of n comes out of here. And then there, there are some added terms, but they are small o. That's my claim. So, lots of so how, questions. Lots of hmm? questions. Yeah. Many questions. Uh, so, first, first question, even before we get to uh, what you call the hardest part. Uh, so, what are we doing? We, we first went from uh, dimin to dmax to do the upper bound. And, that yeah, that's d mean of one minus epsilon d mean of one yeah yeah so so we went there because uh we want an upper bound which uh, essentially tells me that you know the error here is uh slightly less than one minus epsilon so okay that makes sense now i'm saying that okay since i want an upper bound i can break this guy further so i i'll break the space into smaller bags each bag is a condition on uh, is a conditioning on uh small x right and uh, mm -hmm. I, 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 I do that by uh, using, using the joint, joint convexity. Great. Yeah. But what I don't get is what this is buying me. Why am I going into the smaller bags at all? I mean, well, because I want to get a single letter characterization. No? This is the asymptotic ID case. I want to get a single letter characterization. In the asymptotic ID case, I want to get a single letter characterization. Okay, 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 fine, fine, fine. Okay, and uh, okay, got it. Yeah. So the single letter is, uh, is creepy. Yeah, yeah, got, got it, got it, got it, yeah, yeah, got it. Got it. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so, so, so uh, yeah. So first of all, um, yeah. So one question you may ask is, I mean, why did I go from D min to D max? Okay, I mean, one is, I mean, you may say, okay, I don't like one minus epsilon, like epsilon, but that's, I mean, that is the lesser requirement. The, that requirement comes at the very last step out here. Okay. So remember, there's a maximization over Xn out here. Okay. So if, uh, if it were, uh, and D epsilon max is the maximum value of a, of a certain ratio of probability. Okay. If I had a d min out here, this would have been the minimum value of, of a ratio 
of the likelihood ratio. So that would not gel well with this. So I want. So this is a maximization. I want to further loosen it and get an even larger quantity. So I should work with uh, quantities that maximize likelihood ratios, not that minimize likelihood ratio. Okay. So in the very last step, this is this is where I will be using the fact that d max epsilon is good, not not uh, d min one minus epsilon. Okay. So. I mean, I mean, keeping this uh, in mind, like I had already changed from d min one minus epsilon to d max. But that comes from here. Okay. For this to make more sense, let's see what is happening out here. So this is Xn. Now remember, I mean, this is the asymptotic ID case, your uh, input alphabet is fixed. So we break up the n tuple Xn into bunches of a fixed set of symbols. It's got a finite number of symbols. So I just break it up into bunches. And if I fix a symbol x naught, let's look at this bunch. Suppose there are, suppose there are k copies of x naught in that n tuple. So I'm just calling it x naught to dk. So I'll see what is the contribution of uh, d epsilon max, okay, to this d epsilon max coming from this bunch, okay. And this is where I'll use. Well, we haven't uh, proved this uh, precisely, which we'll do in later lectures. But this is what I've been alluding to. And a similar thing we had seen in the very first lecture when we looked at uh, one shot uh, source coding. Isn't this right. exactly equal? Isn't this exactly equal? Because all of the x naughts are the same symbol, right? So this should be exactly equal to k times d of whatever this is. Not. No, no, no. The, this is the standard rate event. Oh, okay. That's what, this okay. is d epsilon max. Okay. So, and the, there's a little o of k. So that will be like square root of k if you do the Chebyshev analysis. Okay. Yeah. So the little. So little of k will look like uh, big O of square root of k, but the big O will also hide your epsilon and properties. So what I was saying was there is an intervening step, which is like k times d max epsilon of this thing, right? Because uh, because every symbol is the same. So uh -huh. the max of the probability ratios is also uh, the same. You have to be careful here because uh, if you say k times uh, d max epsilon, see, I mean, in one copy, you're losing epsilon the probability. Okay, if you're doing k copies, you lose the k epsilon in the probability. Okay, oh, okay, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. so, I mean, that argument does not work. So, you, you really have to go to D out here where there is no epsilon anymore. Okay, so, so, so the point is the dependence on epsilon, I can shift to the little o term, which will not matter for my uh, asymptotic ID analysis. Okay, so we've seen this in the noiseless uh, source coding term. The dependence on epsilon went here. Okay, and if you do the full second order analysis, then we'll even know what the dependence on epsilon to in much more detail. But yeah, the point is the dependence on epsilon goes out. Okay, so I should probably put little o subscript epsilon. Okay, so this is for uh, one one symbol x naught. I mean, there's just a fixed set of symbols, so you can do a little bit more of work and push more things than the little o and get this. So basically. Every symbol x naught is giving this co contribution, the uh, uh, relative entropy times k, the number of times it appears. So of course your uh, length of the tuple is n. So if you add all of this up, you get n times this. And remember, I want to maximize right over x n. So the so if I want to maximize, I might just fix the symbol x naught that maximizes this quantity. Okay, and that's what I've done out here. So n. So there's this minimizing QI, which I fixed in this entire analysis. Then this is the X naught that maximizes this Shannon relative entropy, so max X, and then there's little O. Okay. So this will make a little more sense as we, I mean, as we look into this in more detail, which we'll do in later lectures. But this is what uh, is going on out here. Okay. So this is a translation from the N letter to the single letter. And you can see it's a little more sophisticated than what was there in Shannon asymptotic. Okay. And there's a minimization over QI that is there, right? Yeah, Which, that's true. This is not there in the Shannon thing. Yeah, yeah. This is not in the Shannon. And then, I mean, there's all min mac. Uh, I mean, max min is less than min mac. They are not there in Shannon. Okay. So, I mean, the, the proof is very different, it's much more sophisticated. Okay. Then of course there's d epsilon max which you have to analyze and 
use uh, like this lower order analysis, which is also not then Shannon. Okay. okay, further comments? Okay, so that's it. So now, what have we shown for the asymptotic IID case? Remember, like our uh, strong converse rate R prime is less than this, maximization over the input distribution P, but this is on X to the N, joint distribution. Minimization over Q, Y to the N, also a joint distribution. Okay, of the D, D epsilon max quantity. But we argued that this is less than N times the min over QI. Now this is over one copy. Then max over the symbol X, again over one copy. And this is now a one copy, Shannon rate of entropy quantity. That's a bit lower. Okay. Now let's go ahead. But let, let us analyze what is this maximization. Uh, I mean, what is this quantity? Maximization of the symbol X of this quantity. So, so let's see. So this quantity, what is this? This is the Shannon rate of entropy between the joint distribution and the tensor product of the marginals. Okay, so this is nothing but actually the mutual information between the X and Y. Okay, and then I'm maximizing it over the input distribution PX. Okay, so fine, I write this. Now, so let's look at the relative entropy term. So I, I'll replace PY by QY and minimize over QY. But it turns out that the minimizing QY has to be the marginal QY. So this is true for the Shannon relative entropy, which you can prove by concavity of logarithm. Okay, I mean, if you want to minimize the Shannon relative entropy, you better put a PY out. So fine, but I like to put in QY. So I, I put it out here. Then I'll uh, interchange the max min to min max. So normally it will be less than or equal to, but here it is equal to. This is because of a strong duality theorem in a certain sense called science minimax theorem. So essentially what you need is a function which is continuous in X and Y and uh, con uh, convex in the right arguments. So here with equality, I can interchange min max. So I get the min QI max. But, but, uh, but once I have this, then I can again apply the joint convex of uh, this time the Shannon rate event, the same argument as before. So I can drop the probability distribution on PX and just concentrate all the probability on X on a single symbol. Okay, and this is exactly what I had out. So what does this show? This shows the strong converse rate, which is uh, less than this quantity. Okay. So the strong con uh, converse rate, this quantity is uh, less than uh, N times, okay. So this was the mutual information, maxi maximize mutual information plus little of on the other hand, achievable rate is trivially lower bounded by, so we know what is achievable. So uh, like I epsilon min X and Y and maximized toward PXN, okay. But then I will say that, oh, I mean, I only want a lower bound. So I'll not even maximize our joint probability distributions on XN. I'll just take a probability distribution on a single copy X, take N independent uh, copies of PX, and that is my P out here. And then that's it. So, uh, so, so, yeah, so if you do that, then again, it's the same kind of analysis that the uh, hypothesis testing mutual information approaches the Shannon mutual information once everything becomes uh, IID. So it is N times this minus this law. So I know that the achievable rate for error epsilon is larger than this quantity. The strong converse rate for error one minus epsilon is less than this quantity. <laughs> and then uh, this actually proves something stronger. This says that the mutual information to maximize toward PX, what is called the channel capacity, okay, is both achievable and a strong context. Okay, so this not only finishes a single letterization, but also tells me something more that if I have to go uh, above the mutual information rate, the error will jump from epsilon to one minus epsilon, okay, which Shannon's proof did not give you originally. Of course, there were other works which proved it in the classical. IID case, but uh, here we have proved it with our uh, technology. So in Shannon's work, uh, this uh, o, o, small o of n, this was uh, much larger, right? It was like n times some yeah, yeah, theta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, but is, now a, we, this is a better, better. This thing. is a better. Thing. And if you do the actual second order analysis, which the one sure allows you, then we know also how this small o of n looks. Okay. So we know it is, uh, I, I had written it earlier. So it will, it will be, square root of n times what is the information variance times uh, phi inverse of epsilon. Okay, 
where phi is the cumulative distribution function of the Gaussian. Okay. So that's the, and then the third order term is just uh, order log n. So you know that, and, and uh, it's the same term, there's a plus here and there's a minus here. Okay. It's just because the error in one case is epsilon, the other case the error is one minus epsilon. So, so that's it. But it's exactly the same term out there, and we know precisely what it is. Yeah, so we get much more from, from one shot using, uh, I mean, all these powerful machine algorithms, minimax theorem and things like that. Okay, so, so one, stop one thing, yeah. one thing we still haven't proven, which is sort of like the main workhorse here, is that your upper bounding the the d max epsilon of 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 the uh, p x n y n p x n tensor p y n q y n with with the d app and the additive uh, small of uh, k. Yeah, yeah, that that, that, will that, be, is, uh, that is not true. Yes. So this is still black box, but uh, modulo this black box, everything is fine. Yes. Yeah. So. I mean, in the, in the next few lectures, we'll prove this, okay? And I mean, we'll prove this with increasing sophistication. I mean, if you just want to get little of k, it's not so difficult. I mean, even if you want to say order square root k, but then, uh, I mean, you don't, uh, I mean, uh, pin down great detail, what is the orders, uh, what is the constant in that order? Even that is fine. If you really want to pin it down, that is the full second order analysis. But we'll do the full second order analysis. I'm just sort of guessing here, but uh, it, 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 it should be using some sort of concentration inequality, right? Because you want to be evaluating. Uh, yeah, in a, in, a sense, in a sense, but uh, not concentration. It uses uh, uh, very essay theorem, which is a quantitative form of the central limit theorem. Central limit theorem. Okay. 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 So not the vanilla central limit theorem, but I need a quantitative form of it called the very essay theorem. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, enough sophisticated machinery coming up in the way. Okay, further questions? If not, I will uh, stop now. And unfortunately, I have to go to Jibu now urgently. So